Hello and welcome to another episode of the Haskin Cast podcast. I am your host Scott Haskin, and I'm here with another fantastic guest this week, my friend James, who is a conductor. Uh, he's done quite a bit of work. I've worked with him a couple of times over at the University of Las Vegas doing shows, uh, where I was in the capacity of the uh, audio engineer. Uh, part of the team, running the team. I don't know what I was doing really, but I was there to assist and had uh, a couple of crazy gigs. I was actually really excited when I walked into the last one and saw that James was at the podium, uh, not only at the podium this time, but also behind the keyboard. So he had a dual role, uh, whereas last time I believe he was just conducting. I don't think he was playing keyboard, but I could be wrong. Uh, that was a while ago, and I've done so many things since then that uh, some of those little details start to slip away a little bit. Uh, but it was it was fun working with him again. And I talked to him. I said, man, I'd, I'd really love to get you on the show. I haven't had a conductor on yet. And uh, he's really personable. So I thought it would be a, a good uh, fit. And as it turned out, it was. Had a great conversation with him, uh, which you guys will hear in just a few minutes. Now, uh, a couple of things. I've been watching the uh, Black Friday ads for you folks in the music business or uh, those of you who have friends or loved ones in the music business and want to get uh, some good gifts for. Gift certificates are always good because uh, we're very specific about our gear sometimes, and it's not always easy to find the right thing. Of course, uh, you know, polishing materials, you know, cleaners, things like that. Those are our standard because we need that stuff all the time. But uh, yeah, uh, so there are some good sales. Waves has got a list of plugins. But you know, I so far what I've seen, I'm not really buying their Black Friday sale because it's the same sale that they have all the time. Plugins at $29. It's just a matter of waiting for the one that you want to go on sale. Some of them are a little more at $39, but they have those prices all the time. So I'm not really seeing anything magical or Black Friday just yet. But who knows? Uh, they could they could pull out stops at any moment. Um, Musician's Friend is doing its stupid deal of the day. Uh, they've got some really good bargains today. They did like 10 different ones. I only caught like two or three. Uh, again, you know, it's stuff that I see all year long. It's just that now they're compiling it all into one day or at least 10 things into one day, uh, which they do from time to time anyway. So apart from that, I haven't actually seen a Black Friday ad from them yet or Guitar Center or Sam Ash. Um, just keep hearing that the Black Friday sales are coming and we're still a ways off. I mean, it's, it's not quite halfway through the month yet. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, what else? I mean, um, oh, uh, uh, my friends over at Best Service, they are having an actual Black Friday sale going on with some really killer deals. Link is in the show notes. You can uh, just click on that and check out all the amazing things that they have. You may remember my episode with, uh, Eduardo Terralante who uh, puts out some absolutely amazing sound libraries. I, I really love his stuff, and he's such a great guy. Go listen to that episode if you haven't already, because uh, it was a really fun one. In my first international episode, uh, he, was, he lives in Spain. And uh, that was the first time I recorded someone out of the country, and that was a lot of fun. But uh, I try to catch up with him every year at the NAMM show, which is coming up this January. I uh, plan on doing so again this year. At least that's the hope. We shall see. But anyway, Best Service has got some killer, killer deals going on on uh, many libraries. I believe Eduardo's are in there as well. So go check that out in the link in the show notes. And that's about it for sales. Um, I've heard that there's some other things that are happening, but I haven't received any confirmations on them yet. Uh, the links that I found, uh, I've checked, and they're not showing that the sales are live yet. So as I get them, I will keep you posted. I do have an abundance of episodes coming up yet this month. Uh, normally, I would just be doing them on Wednesdays. However... This is the time of releases and special things happening. So I will actually be bringing you a couple of special episodes. Uh, I believe on Friday, I will be releasing uh, my episode with uh, director Brian Skiba, who has a brand new Christmas movie that will be hitting Amazon on Friday. So uh, I want to uh, get the link for you guys before I release the episode. And hopefully I'll have a chance to watch it before I do the opening uh, and release the episode on Friday. And then uh, if all goes well, Saturday, I will be releasing another special episode with my dear friend, Chase McKenna, who probably has one of the biggest hearts of anyone I've ever met. Uh, she's doing some amazing things and could use your help helping others. 
This is, uh, you know, it's weird to say that this is the time of year for giving because we really should be doing it all the time. Anytime we can help somebody out, uh, if it's within our grasp, we should take advantage of that as much as possible. Uh, Not everybody has it as good. Uh, Some people have it better. Some people have it worse. But we all are in this together, this whole survival on earth thing. I don't care what color your skin is. I don't care what race you are. I don't care what your political beliefs are. At the very core of it, We're all human beings, and we should all be helping each other move forward and help the world be a better place. So uh, we'll be talking to Chase about that. And also, she is a fantastic actress. Uh, I first saw her in a short film called Money, Please, which was uh, a very, very brilliant short story about this family who starts playing a board game, and it just kind of takes over their life. (laughs) It's, uh, It's a lot of fun. I'm sure it's online somewhere. I'll see if I can find a link to put in her episode. Uh, it was done by Red and Tan Productions and a very, very great film. But that was where I first saw her and uh, just just thought, wow, this girl is really talented. And then uh, we connected on Facebook at some point. But uh, seriously, she's always doing uh, a lot of, of work to uh, make other people's lives better. And, and of course, this is the time of year when people seem to be more willing to give. Uh, I don't know if it's like a holiday guilt thing or if it's just, you know, I feel warm and fuzzy, so I want other people to feel warm and fuzzy. I'm not really sure what it is. But you don't see people dressed up ringing a bell in July or October or April. I mean, you really only see that in in like late November, early December through Christmas, and then it just disappears. So it's like, that's the only time we really care about helping others. And that really doesn't make a lot of sense to me because people's troubles go on all year long. So let's do what we can to help them and uh, listen to Saturday's episode with my dear friend, Chase McKenna. And that is all the stuff that's coming up. Then I'll be back uh, on next Wednesday with my normal weekly episode. And uh, but let's uh, let's talk to James about orchestration and uh, how he works as a conductor and some of his uh, experiences. He's got some really interesting stories to tell. So let's turn it over to uh, to James. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am very excited to bring you my next guest. I've done a couple of uh, gigs with him, and he's worked as a conductor on the two gigs that I've worked, And uh, but he has a lot of other hidden talents that we're going to peel around and find out what all he does. Let's welcome James to the show. James, how are you today? Good. Thank you. I'm very well. I appreciate you coming on the show. I think you're the first person with an accent. (laughs) Yeah, well, thank you for having me, and I hope everyone understands. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I don't I don't think it's too confusing. No, actually, you're the second. My friend Eduardo, who came on the show uh, earlier this year uh, from Spain. But uh, yeah, it's it's nice to, you know, I, I grew up listening to so many British bands and so many British interviews that I feel like when whenever I'm interviewed, I want to speak with an accent, even though I don't have one. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that that's that's some of the sometimes that's the thing with accents when you talk to people with strong personalities and strong accents and and you kind of feel like you know you're like being tractor beamed into their into their accent or into their personality um but no i i love accents i like i really i really get into them i actually uh don't really enjoy the australian accent <laughs> and <laughs> mine mine being so thick it 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 um it it personally annoys me uh sometimes but i love accents like everywhere i go I'm always listening out, and if there's, you know, I hear an accent, and I'm like, mm, I can't put my finger on it. I, I feel really compelled to ask people where it's from, you know. I, you know, I'm not big on judging people by where they're from, but I will say that I, I can't think of a single person I've met from Australia, and I've met quite a few that hasn't been just a really, really wonderful person. Oh, that's really lovely of you to say. I mean, I, I think at least the stereotype of Australians is that is that we're fairly kind of casual and laid back that's you know in my experience that's not always the situation Mm -hmm. um but but kind of yeah as as a culture we're a little bit uh slow paced maybe is not the right is not the right way to say it but um yeah most most australians definitely those in the arts or in the entertainment industry tend to be really quite you know nice personalities and easygoing and uh you know, and there's and there's a ton of us here now in in Las Vegas and in the in the wider United States as well. Absolutely, and and I yeah, I would say um, laid back maybe isn't the right word. I would say somewhat relaxed. You, there's there's not a, an intensity or like a you know a freak out moment. It's like everyone I've met has just been like just very even keel. 
Yep. Yeah, no, that that's actually that's beautiful. That that's that's great. Ignore what I said. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations for the stress of living in America, not getting to you. <laughs> oh, oh no, it's fine. How uh, how long have you been here? Uh, I moved here in the spring of 2016. So I guess this is this is my fourth year, like four going on five years. Okay. Uh, that I've been here in Las Vegas and. It, before I moved here, I I mean, the U.S. is always, well, not always, but for a long time, the U.S. has felt like a second home uh, to me because when I was doing my undergraduate degree uh, in jazz vibraphone back in Australia, uh, I found myself coming out to the States at the end of every year to, uh, you know, to take lessons from from guys that were, you know, pro pro jazz musicians, pro jazz vibraphone players, specifically the New York, Philadelphia, Boston region. Um, and that became a really expensive habit. I just kept doing it <laughs> year after year uh, until I finally uh, uh, moved here in, in 2016. So I guess I spent a good uh, five, six, maybe seven years back and forth um, to the U.S. just, you know, on, on little sojourns, tri- trips and whatnot. That's crazy. That's such a long flight too. I think from here to from Vegas to Australia, depending on where you're going, is about 18 hours, and I can't sit still for about 30 minutes, even in a movie theater. Yeah, it's it's funny. Um, I yeah, I really don't enjoy the flight. I, I'm not afraid of flying, but 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 flying to me is an uncomfortable experience. Yeah, uh, and that that flight definitely tests your patience. Um, sure. Uh, yeah, for, from Las Vegas to depending what port you go into in Australia. So for me, it's usually Brisbane. Uh, there's not a direct flight from Vegas. So, you know, you kind of got to go to San Francisco or Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's it's about it, it can be anywhere between 12 and 14 hours um, from the west coast of the United States to the east coast of Australia. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a long flight. I've got a little joke that uh, you may want to edit out. Um, about it but when when people ask me about you know say you know how was your flight and this is always my standard answer i say it's just like a colonoscopy even if it goes right it's still a pain in the ass <laughs> well that sums it up i think you know it's it's interesting though that that you would have uh, a, a reroute through san francisco that's so far out of the way yeah, it's you know what the australian airlines tend to not do that route anymore that's a route that the New Zealand airlines that that, that travel through to Australia tend to use, uh, but yeah, it, it makes for a, for a long a long transit if you kind of go up to San Francisco, and then if if you're doing Air New Zealand, um, which is you know great airline, uh, and I love New Zealand, but then you go down to Auckland, and then it's another three hours from Auckland to Australia, and it's 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 a big commitment. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, and Australia is from what I've seen of it is such a beautiful place and it's just so much beautiful land, but I have to admit a friend of mine ruined it years ago. And now I I would just be terrified to go there because the way that they make it look is that everything wants to devour you or just rip you to shreds or box you. You know what? I, I, I get a lot of people that tell me that, um, and you know, Australia is a very beautiful country. Um, for those that may be uh, unaware, uh, country the Australia, the, the country of Australia is about the same size as um, the United States. If you if you don't include Alaska and Hawaii, mm-hmm. sorry, Alaska and Hawaii, <laughs> right. um, but it, it roughly is a similar size. Um, but we have like a uh, oh, I don't want to get this number wrong, but I think it's somewhere around thirty million people uh, in Australia, but. Uh, somewhere around 90% of the population live within 100 miles of the coastline. We don't have a lot of stuff that lives in the middle of the country like like here in the U.S. Right. Yeah. Um, so a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of people from Australia, you know, grow up in in green places with water on coasts with beaches and cliffs and and all this really beautiful stuff. But uh, Australia has quite a uh, quite a diverse landscape. Um, right in the middle of the country is is kind of barren desert wasteland, a little bit like uh, like outside Las Vegas here or going into Death Valley. It's a, it's kind of similar situation. Mm-hmm. It's nice though that there's some places in this world that are still just the earth and not overdeveloped city life. 
Right. And Australia and New Zealand, actually, uh, I, I always tell people if they're bothering to go to Australia, definitely hit New Zealand because it's right. It's, you know, it's right there. Uh, and, and New Zealand is also beautiful. I mean, New Zealand is, is uh, on like two tectonic plates uh, of the earth. So it's very mountainous, um, but it's, it's beautiful. I mean, you can drive in New Zealand for four hours and go from, you know, urban city to rainforest to beautiful lakes to mountains to farmland to like it's 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 so beautiful and diverse. Um and and a lot of it is is kind of unspoiled like a lot of the country in Australia is and it, and it, it is really nice to see that that you know not everything's built up. Yet. Yeah for sure. I mean we've developed so much of this country that it's it's getting harder and harder harder to find places where you can't see a city. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you were studying jazz vibraphone. That's very specific. What uh, what drew you to that specific discipline? It's funny, man. I growing up in high school, I was fortunate to have uh, a, a really exquisite percussion teacher during high school who brought me up as an all round percussionist, and I and I thank him every opportunity that I get for it. Uh, his, his name's David Quinn. Uh, maybe he'll listen to this, but. Um, he yeah he he brought me up uh you know learning hand percussion and mallet percussion and timpani and drum set and and marimba and and orchestral music and jazz and and really gave me a great um cross section of music and and what it did for me was really prepare me well as a musician for the for the professional and the real world um but when I was in high school this is this is how I got down the jazz vibraphone part is that the director of music at the school, uh, his name is Matt Christensen, he, uh, his, his top-level big bands had a competition coming up, uh, the school big band had a competition coming up where the, the set piece uh, had vibraphone doubling the melody with, I really can't remember what it was now, probably alto saxophone or trumpet or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, because it was a required set piece, um, you know, he really wanted, you know, vibraphone in the band. So I got taken on uh, when I was in ninth grade to, to play vibraphone in the, in the group. And, I, and it was just a whole different experience from playing in concert band and symphony orchestra and percussion ensemble. And I, I really enjoyed this, this new side of music that I discovered. So as I kind of went through 10th, 11th, 12th grade, in Australia, I started leaning more and more toward jazz and listening to it more and, and trying to learn how to improvise. And so when the time came for me to decide uh, what to do when I finished school, I mean, I mean, from about from about the 11th grade, I knew that I wanted to go into music. I mean, at the time, I was actually uh, fulfilling a, a, a mechanic apprenticeship, an automotive uh, mechanic apprenticeship. Because, you know, I grew up loving cars and like kind of stuff. And at some point I just decided that, no, I'd rather I'd rather kind of pursue music. So that that's what I did. I thought, well, you know, this is really diverse and I love, you know, I love it. I love improvising and, and vibraphone is really unique. So let's pursue that. The curse of it, however, was that at, at that time there was very few people in Australia that were, that were doing jazz vibraphone as their, you know, main thing which is what led me to, you know, come over to the U.S. Uh, to, to, to take lessons uh, from guys in New York and at Boston, Philadelphia, and even uh, Los Angeles, um, because they just, the, the, resource, the, the resources weren't quite as available uh, in Australia at that time. And I was actually the first person at the conservatory uh, that I went to to, to, get a, to, to get a Bachelor of Music in, in Jazz Vibraphone, and they opened up the strand for me and i i guess i was kind of the guinea pig for it wow yeah do you find uh did you find though or even when you were looking at going into that field did you think it was going to be pretty limiting career-wise the opportunities that you would have because it's such a specific instrument you know what it's as a kid i didn't really think about any of that <laughs> sure yeah. i you know i i was just like this is cool and i want to do this and and, you know, really wasn't, you know, wise enough or experienced enough to, to know any of those kind of economical decisions. But, um, yeah, I just kind of thought this is a cool thing and I want to do it. And, and the fact that not a lot of people do it didn't 
you know, wasn't wasn't something that swayed me either way. It was just another cool thing that not many people do this and I do. Right. Um, but so, you know, I did that for a while. And, and here's where I have to really thank uh, David Quinn again for bringing me up as an all-round percussionist uh, and, and more so as an all-round musician because as I kind of progressed down that jazz vibraphone path and discovered – um, certain difficulties in this day and age with being a jazz musician, specifically in the Australian scene, um, you know, for me, in, in terms of just career development, I was pulling on other skill sets, you know, to, to do other gigs, which, which wasn't a burden at all. I mean, I, I, I love that I can do a bunch of different things and it keeps, it keeps me sane and it keeps me engaged and focused. Um, and you know, I, I feel really fortunate and really lucky to be in the position that I am today in which my week or my month, um, looks completely different, you know, from week to week or from month to month, uh, where I could be, you know, on the podium conducting, I could be, you know, writing new music for an ensemble that's commissioned me or performing as a percussionist in a show or in a jazz group or a show band, um, or, you know, playing, do, you know, doing vocal coaching for music theatre performers or, 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 you know, MDing shows and playing keyboard and doing the keyboard conducting thing. Like, I'm, I'm very fortunate that, that I had people around me growing up that, that, uh, that influenced me to go into these different areas. Sure. And the nice thing is if you needed to, you know, pinch hit on timpani or something, mm-hmm. you could do that as well. Yeah, that's it, man. I mean, it, it, it's it's as I said, my my performing career and, and my week to week, month to month is is very diverse. I, mean, I play a lot of timpani, a lot of drum set, a lot of vibraphone, a lot of you know other percussion and all the other things that I mentioned. You know, what's interesting to me is how many percussionists I know that don't really uh, feel comfortable on a drum set. It's it's interesting, and and this is this is one of my several kind of proclivities about um, the education or music education for specifically percussionists in in universities. Um, and it's a difficult one because university education for percussion directs uh, directs the students into playing solo repertoire on snare drum, on timpani, and on marimba. They're considered our kind of solo instruments or our the instruments that give us the most to learn you know, etude material, te- technical works, whatever it may be. And, and I would say well-rounding also because they're, you know, if you if you can learn marimba, you can learn a lot of other things. If you learn snare drum, you have the basis for a lot of other things. So, yeah, I could see those being the right choices. Right. So, you know, those, they're, they're great as, as foundational and fundamental instruments where you can learn skills that are very transferable. Um, however, what then happens is, the areas of um, hand percussion or zillow percussion, drum set, and even vibraphone get somewhat neglected by percussion majors in university programs. So the drum set players that you frequently see around come, if they've got you know college education in music, they usually come from the jazz degree side of things um, for, for drum set. But there are a ton of percussionists uh, out there that, that are that are great percussionists and great drum set players as well, and that was something that that was very much um, was very much influenced upon me when I was when I was in high school. I mean, I had a great percussion teacher, as I mentioned, and I also uh, took on lessons with uh, you know one of Australia's greatest drum set players. His name's Mark Charters, um, who's a, you know a first call musician for any musical theatre production. Any any touring music theater production in Australia. I mean, he's he's the guy that gets called first. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was, I was very lucky to to learn from him and and be able to balance you know a, a very heavy drum set focus with with the other percussion that I was doing. But no, you, you're right. I I always come across great percussionists that that don't really play drum set or don't really play hand percussion. That's unfortunate because when I when I go and do master classes and clinics and and teach students. I, I really encourage them to explore those areas because if the I mean people don't really call you <laughs> anymore, but uh, you know it's email or text message or something. Right, but yeah. when when you get called upon, let's say for a gig, 
as a percussionist, you want to be able to say yes to whatever they're asking you to do. Sure. You know, and and so that that's 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 you know how I feel about it. Well, and I would think that you probably feel the same way as a composer too, because whatever somebody needs you to write, you want to be able to say yes. You want to get the job, and you want to be able to do the work. Right. Yeah, that's it as well. I mean, that's. That, that's actually a really great point. And, and this, I mean, we could go through so many different disciplines discussing this, mm-hmm. um, but, but you're right. I mean, as a composer, uh, it's, it's going to be so much better for you if you have studied and analyzed and are informed by, you know, classic works of Beethoven, Mozart, you know, and, and film music like John Williams and Danny Elfman and then jazz you know, jazz stuff and, and commercial stuff and pop and, and being able to kind of, in a sense, to be a chameleon across a bunch of different styles and genres, it makes you very, very employable. It makes you a great as- asset to any team. Oh, absolutely. And you can grow so much by just learning different one different style. You can add so much to the one you're comfortable with because you'll right. see it in uh, from different angles and you'll see new things. Like I'm a drummer, but when I started playing bass guitar, I started looking at music completely differently because I'd never seen through those eyes before. Right. But but drum set playing is a is a different discipline from percussion because it's a different kind of syncopation, and it's yep. four limbs doing things instead of two or three. Right. You know, it's it's a hard thing to get used to uh, for a lot of people, and uh, I could see somebody being very very good percussion wise, but just not finding that uh, that right syncopation to play a drum set. Right. Yeah. You you're completely dead on, and you said something really interesting that I, that I always uh, I always love talking about which is, uh, you know, you're a drum set player, but when you started playing bass, you, you saw the music from a different perspective, whether it's, you know, being informed uh, when playing the bass, being informed from drum set playing, when playing drum set, being informed from the bass playing that mm-hmm. you like. It, it, it works either way. And I find that all the time with, with everything that I do. I mean, it, it's most useful when I'm conducting or when I'm an, uh, I'm an MD for a show and my knowledge of, you know, percussion and drum set and, and piano playing and wind playing. When, when I was in uh, middle elementary school and middle school, I, I played brass instruments. I'm, I mean, I played uh, tuba and euphonium and, and trombone to an extent. Mm-hmm. And those experience, although I didn't, you know, go on in any means professionally with those instruments, the experience of playing those instruments deeply informs me as a, as a conductor, you know, with a group because I understand you know, the process of, of breathing for the instrument and how long it takes for an instrument to speak, you know, as, as it, 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 it's funny when you have drummers and percussionists, I mean, they uh, almost immediately follow uh, the baton or where your downbeat is, but for wind players and definitely for string players, they take a little bit more time to get to, to get to their sound or the best part of their sound. Mm-hmm. And so understanding those kind of fundamental concepts, um, you know, is, is, is priceless. And, and again, I've got to thank my diverse background for, you know, informing me of, of those situations before getting to them. Oh, absolutely. And, and be, being able to be uh, working as a composer and as a conductor, it's really important to know how the instruments work. You don't have to be an expert at them, but certainly right. be able to understand that people need to breathe, that they can't get from this note to that note in a split second and that sort of thing. Right. I when I started composing classical music, the those the biggest mistakes that I made were not understanding note ranges, because I yep. was working off of a uh, a chord sequencer which will allow you to do a cello at the very highest note on an eighty eight note keyboard. Right. Uh, so there's that, and then also <laughs> just not understanding that the the movements, the reaching for the notes, going from one note to another, and breathing, you have to consider all of that if you're going to write for something that's going to be performed. Yeah. No, that, that, that's totally it. I mean, there's, there's all these little kind of intricate things from instrument to instrument that on, on, on one instrument are very simple and very straightforward and easy to do, but, but on a different instrument, for whatever reason, it, it could be really difficult. I mean, a, a perfect example is, I mean, you and I, we just did, we just did fun harm or just worked together on fun harm. Mm-hmm. And in the orchestration, we have this repetitive figure, do, 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 and it goes across pretty, most of the instruments throughout the show and uh it's funny when it's on the clarinet in a certain register it crosses uh of the b flat b natural break on the clarinet which is which is difficult 
uh, to cross. Um, then on the cello, it's it's you know it's it makes for difficult fingerings. But then on the piano, it's simple. Um, you know, on on uh, guitar, it's it's more simple. You know, right. um, yeah. so it, it's it's interesting when when you kind of know those those little bits and pieces. I mean, what one of the greatest things that I've learned in the past kind of 12, 18 months is how to appropriately or, or idiomatically write for a harp, for, for, for harp. I put a hard R sound in there then so people can understand me. Because <laughs> I say harp, right. and I've said that many times to musicians, and they always look at me with a puzzled face, and I have to go, oh, I'm sorry, harp. <laughs> uh, but understanding... You know how the pedals work on a harp, and 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 what's possible and what's not possible due to those the, those you know pedal configurations and how much time it takes to to change them and 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 so on. And and another big component of that is how far the harpist's fingers can stretch. Much mm-hmm. like a, a bass guitarist, if your fingers can stretch a, a wide uh, range, then you can do so much more than if you have short right. fingers, because yep. the harp strings, you know, they they encompass a, a quite a width. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's very extensive. I mean, thankfully, uh, you know, a piece that I recently just wrote for the UNLV wind orchestra. I mean, we had a great, uh, harpist that I've worked with uh, a bunch of times and, and, uh, because I knew her, I could, I could actually send her through the music and, uh, and, you know, ask, you know, is this okay? Are my pedal markings correct? Uh, you know, is this possible? Is this, you know, is this comfortable? Is this not comfortable? Those kinds of things. And, uh, it, it's nice to have, that kind of relationship with with musicians uh on instruments that you're somewhat foreign to uh and i i actually get it all the time from from uh professional composers like i got a great friend who works in film and tv in california and he's done a lot of stuff a lot of movies and uh, you know video games and, and documentaries and all that kind of stuff and he's forwarded me through uh timpani parts to uh you know concert works that he's written asking you know is do you think this works is this doable you know hey, with with your kind of experience and skill what do you think you think the average kind of player could handle this or is it more advanced thing and uh it, you know it's really nice uh it's really nice to be able to do that and when when people do it because it just, it just makes for better music well, and it's it's smart to do that, too, because figure it out now while you're writing it instead of when you're at the scoring stage, when it's costing you ten thousand dollars an hour for your orchestra. Right. That's it. Yeah, absolutely. No, and it's great to have those kind of connections and to be able to to reach out and not worry about, well, you're going to be judged by your friend or, you know, why don't you know this? You should know this. You shouldn't be writing for the instrument if you don't know what you're doing, that sort of thing. Because there's so much judgment. Um, it's yeah. really good to have a team of people that you can use as go to's. Yep. No, for sure. Yeah. But, but that's interesting. I didn't notice that about the the break in in the the clarinet on Fun Home. But now that you say that, that makes sense. The other thing that kind of I thought was interesting about that show is that the lead character uh, is a is a young girl. Well, they they have the girl in three stages of her life as a as a child, mm-hmm. as a, a teenager, and as an adult. And right. the the adult never leaves the stage. She she is there from the beginning to the end and does not go off stage one time. Which, as an audio engineer, I found that frustrating because if anything happened to her mic, if she needed to yes. change out a wire or something, what, what could yes. you do? It, you know, it's funny because that is exactly that is exactly where my head went the in it. You know, the first time I realized that she never leaves ne- never leaves the stage, and and in the the initial production meeting, or, or at least one of the first production meetings for that production. I remember saying to the sound team, you, you're probably going to want to, to double mic her because she never leaves the stage. So if you've got a problem with one element, hmm. then, then you know, we don't really have opportunity to fix it. Right. Um, but, you know, it's, it's so funny that you say that straight up. And, and again, I mean, one of the other things I did, again, this is thanks to, to David Quinn, who's my percussion teacher. He was also a very avid sound designer, sound engineer, and, and, and ran a, uh, ran the recording studio that was uh, attached to the school that I went to in Brisbane. Very beautiful school. Very lucky to have those kind of facilities. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, I, I grew up through school with with sound design and engineering uh, understanding, and that has been invaluable going into particularly theatre productions in being able to talk with sound tech, sound designers, and and be on the same page about 
things and, and limitations. And, and that's a perfect example that you just brought up. Well, that's one of the things that I really liked working with you uh, is that you you're not afraid to be vocal and say, can we try this? Is this dangerous? Is this going to cause a problem? Do we need to be aware of this? Uh, right. Because it's it's great to work with people, especially as a, as a conductor who's going to handle the orchestra for me and I just have to mix you. Um, yeah. I know that I, I can feel confident in that if there's something that's that's weird, you're going to let me know. You're not going to worry about telling me anything or feel like you're overstepping your bounds uh, right. because we, we both realize that the most important thing is the quality of the show. That's it. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the show, the music, the art form, the production, whatever it is, the bigger thing, uh, you know, it's, it's bigger than us. You know, it is bigger than us. And we have to, you know, we have to, or at least try to, to see it that way, that, 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 that things, uh, you know, sometimes we can, we can get a little bit uh, into our own, our own duties or our own, our, our own work. We have to remember about the, the bigger, the, you know, the bigger thing, the bigger scheme of things. Exactly. At least though, when I, when I went in this time, I got two rehearsals before we went live. Uh, right, right. <laughs> when we did Pippin, I literally got two songs and then they opened the house doors and I'd never seen yeah. the show, didn't know anything about it. I didn't know anybody. Yeah. I had a small orchestra and 16 vocalists. Yeah. And just, oh, yeah, go mix this. You know, it's it'll be fine. And of course, as soon as there's the slightest uh, hint of feedback, you got 20 people just turning around and scowling at you. Yeah. It's, uh, it's not the greatest position to be in, I'll say. It's hard, man. I mean, I really feel for you guys when when you do sound for that situation specifically. You get, you, you know, unfortunately, there are all these kind of weekend weekend warriors, weekend quarterbacks that as soon as, you know, some feedback appears in a show, you know, it's, you know, you, you completely, you know, in the noose or, or you know, under the, cut, under the cutting board or whatnot mm. um, about things like that. And, and it's unfortunate because, you know, as you know, and as I know, the feedback can occur for a bunch of different things that that that'll that'll that sometimes are completely out of your control. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, Pippin Pip, was interesting, as you said. I mean, sixteen or, or more vocalists, perhaps. Uh, you know, twelve twelve piece orchestra, and uh, you know, you as I said, man, I've said this a lot of times. You did beautifully um to to come in and 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 handle that as the same with fun harm in in a in a in a you know not so great situation in which we you know we got you to come in and and, and help us out well thank you very much i i appreciate that and and i have to say at least on fun home you had a great audio team already in place they're they're oh. young kids but they're eager they uh -huh. uh, they asked a lot of questions they genuinely listened and and you know were very um interactive and uh mm -hmm. as opposed to last year where the people were kind of like you know they they didn't want to ask anything they just kind of wanted to watch and observe which you're only going to learn so much from um i think these girls have a really really good future ahead of them because they they really want to be good at what they do and they're passionate about audio which is great you don't see a lot of female audio engineers no you, you're you're completely right and and i agree with 100 percent of what you said i mean we had we have good students and, and in that situation for fun home we had good students who just did unfortunately didn't have the right uh training mm -hmm. for, for that that point in time um and, and again having come in and and talking through some things uh was was so great and we're so thankful for it and i know that those those girls i mean uh, from what i saw and, and from what you've said about you know, they're asking questions and they, they want to know and they want to do better. And of course, man, I mean, you, you know, you, you don't want to be the person who everyone's turned around to and tell them, you know, tell them that there's problems or, or whatever. But no, those those ladies are, are very, uh, you know, very forward thinking. And and uh, I believe I'm working with both of them on Little Shop Horrors in the spring. Excellent. And 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 I'm really looking forward to working with them because uh, I, I know that 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 fun home for them was was a really big learning curve really big learning experience and you know that's those things in hindsight are, are sometimes some of the greatest experiences you can get when you get you know you, you fall on your ass for one reason or another whether or not you, whether it's you know you got dumped into a situation or you know so, you know something happens something existential happens or whatever but uh, at least for me 
the the times in my life and my career where I've you know just landed face first in the dirt on something and then picked myself back up. I mean, those were invaluable. Absolutely. You know, it's it's funny when you get thrown into the fire like that, you can potentially learn so much more because you have you're forced to solve issues that you would never deal with otherwise. Right. You know, but uh, I what I, I want to ask you some questions about conducting because I've never conducted. I've other than you and in a couple of other gigs, I've not done a lot of work with conductors. So it's a bit fascinating to me. And, and I kind of want to know. When you let's say that you got a call today and said, "Hey, we want you in December to be our conductor at this show," uh, what what are your first steps that you do to set up a show for success? Wow, that's interesting. That, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, you know, it's funny. I don't, I don't feel like I have a go to kind of process with that. It's it, it's it's all very subjective. I mean, if it's you know a, a show that that I know very well I've done before or whatever, then that's, that's obviously much easier, mm-hmm. uh, an easier process for me because it, to some extent I already know the show, but if it's something that I don't know, then, you know, I start looking for recordings. I start looking for music to understand, uh, understand it. If in, in some situations I might look further of, you know, other shows that the composer has done, um, you know, if there's in the case of Fun Home, like it was based off, you know, a graphic novel, and, and you go and look into the background of the show to really understand the content of the show outside of that 90 minutes of content, because I mean that 90 minutes of content is based on 43 years of life in the in the situation of Fun Home. Right. Um, so so really understanding understanding the story and the world, the, the realm of which it's in. I think is is one of the most important parts for any production member, uh, you know, for for a musical style production, theatrical style production. Um, you know, it's it, story is is always is always at at the apex for me and for a lot of people that I know and work with. Um, we need to make sure that the story is being told, that it's being told well, um, and that that it's meaningful. And so many things in inform that outside of the singing and outside of the acting or the, the choreography or whatever, you know, it goes into the music and the underscoring, the sound design, the lighting design, all those kinds of things. So, yeah, I mean, back more directly to your question, I, I guess if it's a show that, that I'm not familiar with, then I, I try to make myself as familiar as possible um, to begin with, definitely before, I, you know, commit to it uh, and, and, and then go into, you know, auditions or, or into rehearsals so that I can step into rehearsals and understand the complete world of the show that we're in because that, that, that as a music director will inform decisions on, 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 on the music, uh, you know, the vocalization of things, how words are pronounced, um, the stuff of things if it's a pop style versus a kind of legit more golden age style um there's there's lots of stuff out there well sure and if you don't understand the show how are you going to deliver the emotional content that the music needs to have it's just notes on a page until you know how they relate that's it i i i I, i'm really thankful a great friend of mine back in australia is a friend and a colleague great director great educator great performer his name's tony campbell he uh he came he, he came to visit me here in the US when I think I was doing legally blind in rehearsals for legally blind and so he kind of shadowed me while I was uh, teaching and, and and adjusting music vocal parts and, and rehearsing scenes and, and whatever it might have been at that time and he said something really lovely to me that that uh, you know I was really happy to hear because that it is what I try to do he said uh, you know you live and breathe the music and the show you know, you get in, you get into, you don't just go, okay, here are the note, here are the, you know, the dots on the page that tell us what pitches we have to sing and these are the lyrics, but you really get into the music and how it serves the story and how it, how it propels, how it propels the story and the show forward. And, and I was, you know, really humbled to, to get that, that kind of uh, feedback uh, from him, but it, it's something that I try to do and what I think great music directors do. I would agree with that. And and as a film composer, I look at it the same way because you you really have to be able to 
uh, drive it, but also support it at the same time. You can't, you know, you can't really override it unless you're specifically meant to do that musically. Uh, right. Really, you're you're just playing the supportive role. But if you're if your cellist is doing a solo piece and they're just playing the notes and there's really no emotion to them, then the audience mm -hmm. isn't going to understand what the character is going through. Uh, they're not. Well, they might understand it intellectually, but they're not going to feel it, which is what the musical side is all about. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, it's funny you say the passion thing. There's a great, there's a great uh, quote. I'm, I'm not going to get it 100% uh, correct, but I'll paraphrase it to some extent. Um, there's a quote from Beethoven that that something along the lines of to play uh, a wrong note is insignificant, to, but to play without passion um, is is unforgivable. Terrible. Unforgivable. That, that's yes, the one. Yeah. I love that quote. Yeah. It's so true. Yeah, yeah. Th th thanks for giving me that that last <laughs> word. I was like, "Oh, what's the last word?" I've almost got it right. Um, well, it's as a drummer, it's kind of like the difference between hitting the drums and playing the drums. Right. Yeah, you, you're totally on it. I mean, there's finesse, there's finesse and passion to it. You know. Right. Exactly. Um, it's it's really interesting too because you you're really paying attention to a lot of things. You're reading the score, but you really have to know the score pretty well to conduct, don't you? Mm -hmm. You can't just walk in and say, OK, I'm just going to conduct this piece that I just started looking at 20 minutes ago and flip through. I mean, you really kind of need to know it. Yeah, I mean, you you need to be really involved with it. And I, d depending on what the situation is, the context is uh, as a conductor um, kind of determines determines to what extent how, how well you know the score. I'll, I'll give some examples. If I was conducting, say, a wind band piece or an orchestral piece in which all, all I'm doing is conducting them, um, then I would have the music memorized or at least mostly memorized, you know, all the all the entering parts and all the count nodes and all the important stuff of, of which has, has has been rehearsed. But having that um, that intrinsic knowledge of of the score is important because you you know you are shaping that music, that world. You need to know everything about it. When you go over to something like music theater and say in the situation where, uh, like, for example, Fun Home or even Legally Blonde, actually, I'll use a great anecdote out of Legally Blonde, um, where I was keyboard conducting, so playing keyboard one and conducting uh, the show. Um, yeah, I mean, you need to be aware of so many things that are going on. You need to be aware of, you know, all the orchestral parts, all the vocal parts dialogue and then if it starts getting into you know songs with with dialogue and underscoring in them you need to be aware of so many moving parts in 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 the show to make sure that it kind of comes together the way it does um you know and that's that's where vamp vamp bars or safety measures are used a lot in music theater um to to make sure that we can you know finish the tune or, or carry on or whatever at the appropriate time but yes there, there's a lot of moving things going on and it being live being live theater anything can happen and, and here's here's a great story i enjoy telling this actually i'll tell two this one's from legally blonde when i emptied it here we we're coming into uh almost the end of act one song i think it's song nine in the show chip on my shoulder it's a long very long sequence and it has several vamp bars throughout throughout the piece and because of the architecture of the piece is is more complicated than the rest of the show keyboard one which is the book i was playing doesn't really play that much in in that tune that you spend most of the time conducting it to make sure that we get out of the vamp and safety measures together both orchestra and stage and anyway we come to enter the first of the vamp measures and there's this beautiful going on in the keyboard two part well as keyboard programming can be a little bit finicky sometimes um my sensational keyboard two player as he went into that vamp and changed the keyboard patch the the programming uh just kind of fell just oh. just just crumbled on him and he had no sound coming out of his keyboard and i looked down at him and he, he looks up with this kind of you know worry in his eye going <laughs> i don't know it's not making any sound and in that moment I had to take over his role in the in the show. I had to take over the keyboard too, who is is the main voice that drives that song throughout the show. 
So it made my job as MD twice as difficult in those eight minutes while we were, you know, rebooting his keyboard programming so he could play again mm-hmm. um, because I had to, 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 you know, to cover his part, cover my part, make sure, you know, the st- what was going on on stage was happening, the orchestra were together. And we came out of it beautifully, but it was one of those moments that when it happens, you know, I was sweating bullets. Yeah, <laughs> and, I bet. And, uh, it was utterly terrifying because in the back of my head, I've got, you know, person two in the back of my head um, saying, this is going to fall apart, this is going to fall apart, this is going to fall apart, you know, and, and we got through it beautifully with with very little uh, uh, interruption uh, it, to the point where people on stage in the show, or the, or the director of the show, w- was not aware that that happened at all. So, I mean, that's... I was really happy to hear that because it was such sheer panic in the back of my oh, mind. Sure, yeah. yeah. Well, that's that's impressive, and and you know the thing is though that it would, as is typical Murphy's Law of fashion, it would happen during the longest cut of music. Right, that's it. And then I've got a I've got another very similar story. I was I was fortunate to to get the call to play Wicked uh, in Australia over the summer, just past the June July this great production uh, that was happening and uh, you know, we're going along. It was one of the shows again, we're almost at the end of act one. We're about to come up to define gravity, the big, the big uh, act one um, kind of finale. And for whatever reason, I was playing percussion on this. I wasn't the MD. I was, I was okay. playing the, the percussion two book on this show. Big, big setup, 53 instruments in the percussion book. I had a great time, but uh we're coming up and Defying Gravity is about to start. And when I looked up, I noticed that my two video monitors that I had in my little setup uh, weren't on. They, they turned off. Oh. And so I kind of I looked out the, the little, you know, plexiglass shield to the other people in the pit because I was, I was isolated from everyone else in the pit. And power went off to the pit, so or, or at least part of the pit. So three out of the four keyboards in the show lost power wow. and defying defying gravity is run almost for, at least for the first section is is run almost predominantly on 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 keyboard parts definitely keyboard one and two and to an extent three and so we, we you know we get there to to do it and these keyboards are out and i as and this is where my other experience kind of saved us a little bit in the moment um because i've played defying Gra- that Defying Gravity from the show and also the vocal selections so many times for, for different, you know, for vocal coaching people or, 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 or performances or, or whatever it may be. So I knew the song really well and, and how it moved and all the chord changes and the melodic content, whatever. And I just, tur- I, I turned around, I had a vibraphone in my setup and I started, I, I started playing the, uh, you know, the essentially the keyboard one part to the show, you know, the... You know, I, I, I started playing along to, to what I could recall of the keyboard part or at least the the, 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 the piano revision to the score that, that helped us get through. And I remember the MD, great MD, Craig Renshaw, looked down at me and he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a gutsy thing to do in the middle of a show. Yeah, I, but it was just kind of like, you know, what do you do? And, and I, you know, I've got to give so, so many compliments to our beautiful alphabet, Sam Dodermade, who she just didn't even you know flicker an eyelid at, at the fact that half the orchestra disappeared out from under her in in arguably the biggest song of the show. Well, what ha- what happened? Did they get the power back on at some point? We got we, we got the power back on during interval, so we did Define Gravity, uh, uh, boom, and then you know you know you got seventeen orchestras going. What happened to the power? Wow. And so we, we we got the power back on for Act Two. But yeah, I mean, we got through Defying Gravity with uh, with me trying to fill out what I could remember of the piano the, the piano parts uh, on on vibraphone or or, or glockenspiel or, or on xylophone. And in that time that I was kind of covering that, the 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 guy playing keys one uh, was able to run out of the pit into the isolated setup that the keyboard four player was in because he for some reason still had power oh. and so he, he took his keys one book or his piano conductor score and went down to keys four and was and was playing the you know the, the piano reduction for it to get us through once we're about halfway through the song 
But again, I mean, those those two stories are, 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 are great examples of, of of doing things live. Anything can happen. And as you said before, Murphy's Law, I mean, you know, some you got to operate with, you know, whatever. Uh, what is Murphy's Law? It's, it's whatever can happen, will happen, something like that. Right. Yeah. If something bad could happen, it probably will. Right. Uh, yeah, that's the one. So, it, you know, it's it's interesting, man. I mean, you got to you got to be ready for so many things uh doing doing live stuff and and it's it's i think all of us that 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 do live performance are a little bit sadistic in that way when you know <laughs> right. because you know things go bad but when but when you kind of recover from them elegantly it's like yeah that was cool you don't necessarily want to experience it again but it gave you that kind of rush and adrenaline yeah um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting world. Well, it's, you know, if you're working in like, let's say a Cirque du Soleil theater or like a Blue Man Group or La Rev, like those theaters are, they're built for the show. They are constantly maintained wires and, and things are checked. It's, it's, there's always Correct. stuff going on to make sure that the performances are as smooth as can be. When Correct. you're working in theater, it's six weeks worth of work to do a three week run of a show. And yep. the variables are endless of things that could go wrong. Yeah, so you so many things. Yeah, I mean those those short short run productions, you know, and and even I, I mean I I got to give it to 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 touring productions. I mean I experienced doing some of it in in Australia, but touring productions that go on, you know, these kind of eighteen month, two year, three year tours, um, and are bouncing back and forth to different theaters, you know, every week or every other week. I mean that's that that's got to be heavy <laughs> oh yeah yeah for uh, sure you know because yeah it's 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 much like when you when you do a regional or a short run production where you you know you work all this stuff up and then you go into the theater for three weeks and you've got to you know figure out in that time all the things that could possibly go wrong uh, for the touring productions i guess you've got like a day or two days to figure that out right yeah it's crazy um but you mentioned something earlier where you were talking about, um, you know, having to watch the orchestra, but also having to watch the actors. There are times when the actors will sing a little faster or sing a little slower, or there's long passages passages in between where those extra measures come in handy. But not only do you have to know the score, not only do you have to make sure everything's working, you have to pay attention to every member of the orchestra, and you have to get your cues from the actors as well as be the cue for the actor. Yep. Yeah, totally. And, and again, I mean, this is something when, when you're fortunate to kind of be on, on a, on a, on a static or a permanent show, such as, you know, Broadway or, 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 or any of the international productions of that or Wicked or, or whatever it may be, um, you, you start to get in, you know, you get into a rhythm with with your cast members and and understand you know how they're going to do things so things end up being more consistent dare i say most of the time but when you do shorter run at regional productions yeah a multitude of things can happen where you know if it's you know if it's a, a an understudy that's on you know they might like to do the the material a slightly different way or yeah their, their tempos might be different or just the 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 adrenaline rush uh, might make them want to do things a little bit a little bit quicker. Um, you know when there's there's scenes with dialogue and underscoring in which the orchestra is most likely vamping for the actor to finish the dialogue so that we can continue on. Yeah, I mean those those are all uh, dangerous times in which so many things can happen. Um, but even when when you're working with people who who are really consistent. And, you know, they do it the same way and you end up repeating vamp bars the same amount of times every night. There's there's always something weird that that can happen. You know, a microphone goes out, so you've got to adjust, or for me, adjust the volume of the orchestra or, um, you know, a, a line of dialogue gets skipped or someone misses their entrance or, or so, you know, so many things uh, can happen of which you need to be aware of and know how to adjust. Um that I think the most common one, at least in my experience, is that, uh, actors that sing uh, lyrics in a reverse order. <laughs> so, you know, they, they they go they go on they sing something, but it's actually the lyrics for 
you know, the next phrase, mm-hmm. and they, they and essentially they they've jumped over a phrase and starts giving the next the next phrase, and it's a situation where as an MD, when you when you're the one in control, it's like, okay, well, do I know them well enough and trust that they're going to fix it themselves or do I need to fix it? <laughs> right. And it's not like they can just lean down and go, Hey James, what do you want me to do? I know I just screwed this right. up. You know? right. And it's, it, it, it's a really beautiful thing where, you know, and I, I kind of long for these moments as well, because you see, it, you see the deepest into people's souls into those moments where I look up and, and say an actor has, has skipped, skipped a, you know, a, a, a phrase of, of lyrics or, or what it may be. And they tend to then look down at me to figure out what's going to go on. <laughs> and you see this kind of panic, but understanding in their eyes of like, okay, we're in this together and we're going to get out of this together. So let's figure out what to do. Mm-hmm. And, and, and more often than not, it's the strangest things. No words can be said at that time, but the look in people's eyes, mm-hmm. it can, can, you know, help you figure out how we're going to fix this. Well, how do you develop that kind of multitasking skill, though? Because you're paying attention to so many different things and you have to be Johnny on the spot for multiple things in, in, in the same instant. Uh, mm. Were there were, was there anything that you were taught that helped you build that or, or was that something that just kind of happened naturally? You know, what's funny is that I, I never took any formal training in in keyboard conducting. Definitely. Um, or in necessarily music theater conducting. I mean, I I assisted or I was an associate uh, music director with with other with other music directors when I was learning um, for other companies. Uh, my sister being one of them, I learned a lot of things uh, from her. And uh, I've always been, you know, a visual learner. I'll watch people do things, and be like, oh, okay, that's you know how to do them or not how to do them. Mm-hmm. Um, but in a situation like that, it's I think. I mean, I, I don't necessarily really think about exactly what I'm going to do. I just kind of go with instinct. Um, but it's it's kind of figuring out what you know can be can be left on autopilot and is just going to be fine, uh, and what needs your focus and attention at that point. And and for me, in in a situation like like that where an actor skips a line or whatever it may be and it's a situation where we either stand our ground and the actor will find us or we jump to to find the actor because they've just you know barreled along um it's it's figuring out it's figuring out what's the easiest way to do that and and fortunately i mean i I work with such great orchestral musicians that they notice things like that as well so when when they notice without me even having to bring it to their attention they are so much more attentive you know they go to like 200 percent focus um to to make sure that they're they're right on whatever decision is about to be made so that we can all go together um but yeah it's i I mean it's a unique thing where we're really it, you just kind of have to make a decision in in the moment, and sometimes it's right and sometimes it's not. And I mean, I've been in situations where where I have gone, okay, all right, we're just going to start jumping music in into you know to to catch up with them. Or there's been situations where I've gone, you know what, I don't know if jumping to catch them is actually going to be the best thing to do here. I think we just need to stand their ground and they'll find us. Because sometimes when you, you know, if, if they've jumped a phrase and then you jump to catch them, then they jump back oh. to what they didn't do. And you start doing this, you know, chasing dog, chasing the tail motion. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's not good. So yeah, I mean, a lot of it, I think comes down to instinct on, okay, I think this is, this is what's going to be the best thing to do here. Right. And and the more that you work with the same people, whether it be the musicians or the actors or the singers, yeah. Uh, obviously the more comfortable you get and knowing you just, you just like learn by that look uh, how to read them and and what decision they've made as well as how to handle it on your end. Yeah. And, and as an MD and and every, every MD, every great MD does this, they have their own personalized nonverbal communication, either in gestures or, 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 uh, you know, of the look in their eyes or, or anything like that in which informs, 
musicians or, or the actors as, as to what's going on. Um, you know, gesturing when we're repeating in a vamp or when we're moving out of a vamp or, you know, things, things of that, that kind of nature. Absolutely. Uh, so a couple of quick uh, last questions on conducting. I've mm-hmm. noticed that some conductors will conduct with just the baton. Some will conduct with the baton and their other hand. I would mm-hmm. imagine this is, is it a stylistic thing or is it that the piece requires two hands? That That's, you know, I mean, you're full of great questions, well, man. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, it, it's a really, I don't want to say that it's a stylistic or a genre thing. It, it's whatever the music needs or, or whatever you think you can do as the conductor to best serve the music. Um, there have been times where I've conducted with the baton, where I've conducted without the baton, um, where I've been, you know, very expressive with hands or, or just beat time. It, it, sometimes it kind of it depends on the context. I mean, I was taught from my conducting mentors um, that your dominant hand, uh, you know, so in my case and, and a lot of people's case, their right hand is generally what gestures time, um, you know, and that's your beat pattern. Where, so if we're in four, you know, beating, beating four beats with your right hand or if we're in three or whatever it may be. And then the left hand is there to um, to be your kind of expressive uh, expressive gestures, um, but that 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 can be done with with both hands as well. I mean, I, I remember one of my conducting mentors. One of the first things he ever said to me is, "When you stand in front of a professional group, if you just beat time at them, that's that's going to be effective to them." You know, they're right. going to find that offensive, you know, shape the music. Uh, that's that's what your role is. And again, it depends what it is in in music theater as an MD. Uh, if I'm if I'm keyboard conducting, there isn't a lot of there isn't a lot of room to be expressive with hand gestures and all this, you know, sure. choral conducting style style manner, because we've just got to, you know, get, you know, you got to kind of go utilitarian a little bit and just get the job done. Um but if it's a situation where all I'm doing is conducting, then yeah, I'll, I'll try to shape the music more and my gestures and, and be more engaged in that rather than just kind of beating time and showing cues and, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you've got to do what the music needs you to do, um, which is interesting. I mean, both of us being drummers, that's that's something that that some of the great drummers in, in rock bands in history did. I mean, they played drums like Ringo Starr played played drums that best served the music right it was you know it wasn't it wasn't necessarily impressive drumming you know it wasn't impressive or virtuosic like you know a Neil Peart or a you know a John Bonham or a- anyone like that but it it served the music you know yeah you know I it, I've always said that Ringo was a, a fantastic metronome but yeah. he was exactly what the Beatles needed him to be. He didn't need yeah. to be flashy. He needed to be supportive. Yeah, that's it. You know, I mean, he had a couple of interesting things that he did in songs like Tomorrow Never Knows. But for the most part, he just needed to be there and uh, and be a, a rock solid foundation for that band. And he did it in spades. Yeah. And 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 it's great. I mean, there's a great YouTube video out there of, of great, uh, great drums talking about Ringo and what he did for the group, you know, Dave Grohl or Stuart Copeland or mm-hmm. whatever, talking about him um, and 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 what he did, and that's right. I mean, he played exactly what the music needed of him. Well, you know what's really interesting is if you if you watch some old footage of Ringo Starr playing songs like "Love Me Do" and and uh, you know just the straightforward uh, numbers, watch his yeah. hi hat hand because he's not just playing a straightforward four count; he's playing a right. very swingy feel. Right. And he, he does like this wind windshield wiper kind of motion with his wrist, right? Like right. left, right, but yeah, yeah. But when you when you hear him, it just sounds like uh, on the surface, it just sounds like he's playing tick 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 right on you know where he should be. But it's actually right. very swingy. Yeah, yeah, and and it has this great kind of vibe and feel to it, you know. Absolutely, and it, 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 it's it's funny. I mean, mentioning him, Ring Your Star, and 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 Stuart Copeland, I mentioned is uh, both of those drummers really informed the drum set part written for the Legally Blonde musical. Um, throughout 
because I've played I've played the show three times. I've done it twice on drum set and one as a music director here. Oh, okay. And and uh, throughout throughout the score, uh, over the top of certain sections, it'll be like you know, a la Stuart Copeland or a la Ringo Starr or a la really? you know, Ben Folds Five. Yeah, I mean, a lot of a lot of thought has has gone into that, and those little bits and pieces of information are really useful. And I'd love it when I get to those parts in the in the score. Quite literally, like the 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 section, uh, it's in the song "What You Want." Uh, and it says, you know, Ringo Star style feel, and it's a, and it's a real, you know, simple, you know, full beat kind of thing. But I I'd try and play it as best as as Ringo Star would, and, and incorporate you know, like the windshield wiper motion in the hand to get that deal. And right, yeah. That kind of stuff. So yeah, uh, yeah, That's it's fascinating. Cool. I love that though. I love that they really uh, they really try and get you to zone in on the actual feeling they want instead of just saying, "Here's yeah. the beat you're supposed to play." Right. Yeah. And, and yeah, there are some great orchestrators that that do that, um, particularly for rhythm parts, because as as you would know, and as I know, in a lot of rhythm players, that uh, you know, a, a lot of it for rhythm players is in the feel and the groove um, of you know how you interpret those notes on the page, and and any of those little uh, any of those little things written in text can really help inform the musicians about how this needs to be played. Oh, absolutely. And you know, it's it's interesting too, because Ian Pace from Deep Purple, he grew up playing uh, jazz and swing. Yeah. And so if you if you listen to the isolated drum track for Smoke on the Water, you can hear it a little bit better than you can in the song, because in the song, it sounds very straightforward, but he's actually playing a very swingy way uh, uh, to that. Yeah. It's nowhere near as straight as it sounds. It's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So my last uh, conductor question for you is, have you ever conducted with something other than a baton, like a Harry Potter wand? <laughs> um, not a Harry Potter wand, but I have purely because I, you know, I was stupid and didn't, didn't bring my baton to a rehearsal or a performance. I've conducted with uh, like a, 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 a like a vibraphone or, 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 or a marimba mallet. Oh, turn turn the other way around mm -hmm. or a pencil. <laughs> yeah, well, I would think that the ball of the marimba wand would be a little tougher to to manage because it's going to probably make the wand the wand part of it uh, bend a little bit uh, in directions that you right. might not want. But uh, yeah. yeah, I had a friend who who uh, conducted an orchestra for a movie score, and he won't tell me which one it was, but he said he conducted it with a Harry Potter wand. So I, I always ask that question. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Well, James, as we wrap up, I want to talk about some of the things that you have coming up because you're, you know, you tend to be a very busy guy. And uh, but you've got some good things coming up. You're actually going to be a, a, a lead actor in Sweeney Todd. Yeah, it, it's it's funny. It came around in, in a in a really interesting way, but I'm I'm very thankful for the opportunity. There's a great theatre company here in Las Vegas called Majestic Repertory Theatre, uh, who are doing production of Sweeney Todd in January, February, other performances next year, and they they've cast me as as the demon barber, as Sweeney Todd, and it's it, it's a great role. I love that show. I've played it several times as a percussionist. Um, and uh, and th this sees me coming back to stage roles after about five years. I haven't done a stage role in about five years. Um, wow. so, so I'm really looking forward to this. It's going to be great fun. And and the role of Sweeney Todd being, you know, that kind of tortured soul that's hell-bent on revenge um, is is a really interesting character with, with many different kind of layers to it. I mean, you can use the... Um, the the cliche comment that uh that donkey and shrek uses where he's like you know like an onion you know you feel, you feel the less no sorry shrek says that you know i'm like an onion you feel, you feel less but but that's kind of what what sweeney todd is like i mean you use any analogy with layers but there's so many layers to that character um you know based on his experience and and, and based on the past and and it, it you know it's we're, we're just about to start rehearsal, so I'm really looking forward to 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 jumping into that as a nice little side project oh, for the for beginning. Sure. Of the mm. When do uh, performances start on that? Before I believe it opens January 16, and at the moment it's uh, tickets are on sale through February 9, um, and it's it's possible we might extend. So very nice. Well, that theater tends to sell out quickly, so if you guys are listening and in the Las Vegas area or coming to Las Vegas. 
get your tickets quickly. And we'll have that link in the show notes too for the, uh, for the theater. Uh, you're also, but before that one, uh, you're taking a break from that to do Charlie Brown. Yeah. I, uh, recently got asked by this, this great, uh, kind of government, uh, run, uh, theater company in town, Rainbow Youth Theater, great kind of outreach project. They're putting on this beautiful Christmas show, Charlie Brown Christmas. It's a nice short little show. Uh, it's 50 minutes long, five zero. Um, and, uh, yeah, they, they've brought me on to, to music direct this, you know, this, this beautiful show of, uh, there's about 12 or 13 in the cast. There's, there's two different casts, um, of kids. The show has been double cast. Uh, and it's, it, you know, the, the, the music for the show is, is very, very much jazz. It's a jazz trio kind of instrumentation for the show. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to doing that as well. Yeah. Excellent. And then after uh, Sweeney Todd, you're back at UNLV doing, uh, what is it? Little Shop of Horrors. Yeah, that, that's correct. Yeah. And I, I jumped back into uh, my position as resident music director for the Nevada Conservatory Theater uh, with Little Shop of Horrors. And I'm really looking forward to doing that. Um, I really enjoy the show. It's got great music that's informed by, you know, that kind of 1960s uh, rock and, and, and doo-wop uh, stylings, vocal stylings. Um, great music by uh, Alan Menken and Howard Ashman. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. Excellent. Well, before we go, I, I do have one other question for you. So mm -hmm. when we did Fun Home, that was about 90 minutes with no intermission. Mm -hmm. When we did Pippin, that was closer to three hours with a, what, 15 or 20 minute intermission in there. And uh, and the band starts before the show does because you guys are are kind of playing the music while people are getting seated. Uh, right. How do you prepare for a marathon, like a three hour show with a uh, with only a short break where you're probably going to be playing through it anyway? Yeah, I mean, those. I, I was really happy to do Fun Home because it's a short show. But I mean, because it's done in in one act, it, it doesn't necessarily feel that short. Because I mean, you still got to do you still got to do your thing for for ninety minutes, ninety four minutes. I think was how long it was. But yeah, the longer shows, you know, like like Pippin, or you go back into Golden Age shows that are that are very much three hours long. Yeah, they are a marathon, and it's and it and it can really challenge you to your kind of focus and your your level of comfort throughout the show and in the case of Pippin as you know I mean we had the orchestra on stage and I stood the the entire time so you really just gotta for me at least you gotta really kind of zen and and get into that get into that mode of like okay this is this is three hours you know we've got to commit to this um and uh yeah I mean it's it, it's funny so many people think that what we do in the arts is easy but it, it's not it's not easy <laughs> no no it's not and the thing is with pippin too is pippin with pippin was very music oriented whereas fun home mm. there was a lot of downtime uh, in in contrast between the two so you've got a show that's twice as long where you're very busy uh yep. during that and then you had uh, some lulls or you had po points where there was like only a cello or only a violin playing in uh in fun home which you know gave yeah. the, the rest of the band a bit of a break but they were great shows to work on and uh and it's nice to as an audio engineer it's nice to work with a music director that you know you can feel comfortable with and know that you know we have a really good dialogue if something's wrong we're going to work together to fix it instead of you know one person feeling trying to assert dominance over the other and that being more important than the right. show yeah. you know that happens so often it does it it, it really does it, it's unfortunate uh when that stuff happens because i mean as i said uh, earlier in our in our conversation is that you know we've got to do what you know we, the the music or the show will, you know is 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 bigger we you know we've got to do right by that yeah you know, as an art form you know absolutely well thank you so much james for coming on the show uh we'll have the links in the show notes for where people can find you and uh, where they can find the shows that you're working on and uh, it was really great talking to you it was so great talking to you. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. My pleasure. Come back and see us again. Of course. Excellent. Take care, my friend. Thank you. There's so many things that I just learned about conducting, and I'm really excited about that because I've always wondered. I've never worked uh, directly with a conductor before as a, as a musician. 
Uh, as a sound engineer, you know, we really don't talk about the music process too much. We talk about what's needed for the show. Uh, and James and I communicate very well when we work together. So it's always a pleasure to work with him. And uh, But man, I learned a lot. I had a great time talking to him. I hope you guys enjoyed it too. Uh, thank you for joining me on another episode of the Haskin Cast podcast. Please remember to join the Facebook group where you could be entered into a monthly drawing for a Haskin Cast podcast or mental sauna prize. Got a lot of cool stuff coming up and I'm going to be doing uh, some really interesting uh, bits on my own as far as the Mental Sonic Christmas album, so stay tuned for announcements on that. Thank you guys, and we'll see you on Friday for a special episode of the Haskin Cast podcast. Cheers. Cheers.